All right, thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm super excited. Uh, my name is Colin Laverty. I'm the president of Cube Educational Travel. I'm here with my friend, Susanna, uh, representing the Cuban American community and her important role at Google. Um, this is our first ever Cuba Hangout, the first Friday of every month from November through April. We're gonna be exploring relevant and popular Cuba-related topics through conversations with a variety of fantastic speakers and members of our community. The goal of this, uh, of these Cuba Hangouts is to add meaningful content to a complicated and often misrepresented topic, Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations. Uh, the ongoing series is brought to you by Cuba One and Cuba Educational Travel. So a, a brief bit of background before we get into the meat of things. The Cuba One Foundation offers a new generation of Cuban Americans the opportunity to give back to Cuba, build relationships with the Cuban people, and explore its heritage through high impact trips to the island. Cuba Educational Travel, which I have the pleasure of leading, is a leading organization in connecting the people of the U.S. and Cuba through travel. We offer cultural, educational, and luxury travel to Cuba, working with clients to develop unique, customized, and curated experiences on the island. Uh, we often work with U.S. policymakers uh, and other influential individuals in, in the U.S. on um, political and economic de delegations trying to work towards a better relation between our two countries. Um, and we have our fabulous guest speaker today, Susanna Coley. Uh, that last name might ring a bell for, uh, for Cuban watchers and, and Cubans. Um, she's Cuban American and co-founder and head of marketing at Google Cuba. Thanks so much for being here today, Susana. Of course, thank you for having me. Um, so maybe we can start off, can you give us a quick 10 second version of what you do at Google? Totally. Um, so as some of you may know, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Um, and what we're doing in Cuba is focus on the last part of that mission, which is making our products work better and faster for Cubans and in Cuba. In fact, um, we think that that our work in Cuba is the purest embodiment of that mission because it's arguable that um, Cuban users are among those that deserve this the most. Um, I, along with my colleague Brett Perlmutter, co-founded Google Cuba, which is um, a team that brings greater access to connectivity and new technologies and Google products to Cuba to build this notion of uh, digital bridges between Cuba and the rest of the world. Um, we've been working in Cuba for about five years now um, to increase the quality of access to connectivity and access to our products. Um, as a matter of fact, on uh, since prior to December 17, 2014, which is when uh, President Obama uh, announced the reestablishment of diplomat diplomatic relations, um, Google was the only tech company that had a footprint in Cuba. And as a matter of fact, we had actually launched three products there. Um, 2016 was a big year for us uh, because we became the first uh, foreign company to sign an internet deal with Cuban authorities. And what that deal did was deploy Google, Google servers on the island so that it made um, our products work in real time. Uh, for example, YouTube, and this had incredible impact for um, you know, implications for how Cubans used and access um, information online. Um, but really, I think uh, Google's experience in Cuba is evidence that engagement works. Um, I personally am, a, am an advocate for engagement. Um, and in this case, professionally, we were able to engage with the Cuban authorities and strike a deal which directly improves the lives of Cuban users. It's a little more than 10 seconds, but there you go. <laughs> Thank you. That's a wonderful intro. And I can say as somebody who spent uh, or spends a decent amount of time on the island, there's there's a lot of grateful Cubans um, and their family off, side of, uh, off the island that have really benefited. And I think they're super appreciative of the work that you, Brett, and all of your colleagues have done and your colleagues in the Cuban government who have facilitated that. Of course. Um, in terms of um, being a proud Cuban American, um, can you tell us a little bit about, about your journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm a product of the Cuban diaspora. Um, so I was born in Miami. My family's from Havana. Um, and I grew up in Miami, blending between two cultures, two nationalities, speaking two languages, um, and understanding the ambiguity of identity, um, how you can belong and not belong. Um, I obviously look very American, but I feel very Cuban. Um, but you know, really, I think this has helped me adapt to different environments growing up. It's given me the, the ability to blend in in different um, you know, circumstances throughout my life. And it's also given me this um, ability to empathize. Um, growing up, all of my friends uh, also were Cuban American and you know, their families had a very similar story as my family's, which is that they you know, left uh, their homeland, uh, left everything they had and you know, kind of 
came to this new country to make a new life for themselves and for their chi for their children. Um, and I became obsessed with my own family story. Um, I grew up always hearing stories of, um, you know, what life was like in Cuba uh, for my family. Um, you know, grew grew up kind of having this notion of you know paradise lost. Um, and how much, you know, this love that for Cuba that my family has. My abuela was, um, who is my absolute favorite person, always made sure that I was proud to be um, Cuban. She made sure that this was instilled from um, in me in a young age and, you know, always told me stories of her walking along the Malecon um, as a young girl and, you know, just some of the things, what, what life was like and um, everyday life. And, you know, really I became obsessed with not only my family's story, but I became obsessed with Cuban history and politics um, and really tried to learn and consume everything I could about that. And as I grew up, I, I really came to see a distinction between the different generations of Cuban Americans. Um, and based on my experience, I came to see a distinction between the generation that I'm a part of, um, first generation Cuban Americans. And we're defined by a few things. I think one is that we are very eager to um, reconnect with the island that our that our parents and, and grandparents left because it makes us feel closer to our heritage and where we came from. Um, the second thing that I think we're defined by is that we have a hope that we'll one day see a world in which we'll be able to travel freely and that there will be a free flow of information between um, these two countries. And then I think the third thing is that we see technology as the missing element um, and, and the answer to, to kind of many of the barriers that we face today. Um, and I know I speak for many Cuban Americans um, that are watching right now when I say that our generation feels a responsibility to carry this torch to reconnect to the island that our grandparents and parents left. That's uh, very touching. I can imagine with your, given your story, the work that you're doing and the relationships that you're building, um, how powerful and, and meaningful that must be. Um, Absolutely, yeah, it's incredibly personal. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, anyone who's visited a Wi-Fi park and can see folks, you know, connecting um, for really the first time in many years with family off the island using new technology, um, you know, you can really understand the importance. Can you talk a little bit more about connecting Cubans and Americans and, and building cultural bridges and what that means to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, like I just, like I already said, and I'll probably say it again um, before the Hangout's over, is I... I firmly believe in engagement um, between the U.S. and Cuba um, on all fronts, on cultural fronts, on commercial fronts, and I think these are the. This is the way that this notion of these, you know, we I, I mentioned earlier this digital bridges. This is kind of how we think of them and how I think of them. Um, you know, I think we have so much to learn from Cubans on the island, and vice versa. And I think the only way to kind of facilitate this exchange is if in fact there are um, platforms that can um, facilitate uh, back and forth communication, back and forth um, sharing of, of cultures. Um, from a professional standpoint, uh, the work that we're, that we're doing in Cuba, we really double down on cultural collaborations. Um, for example, we, uh, we uh, filmed and launched a virtual reality documentary on the life of Jose Marti that highlights um, you know, the, the, the path that he took while in the US um, and also you know, parts of his life in Havana. And this really kind of incorporates culture um, and also uses you know, state-of-the-art technology as a vehicle to do that. Um, I think Google, along with other technology companies, ha can have a really vast impact in this area because we're in the business of connecting people and our platforms are um, conduits to these connections. And so um, really the more um, conduits or platforms that Cubans can have access to, the more these connections can take place. Um, again, like I said earlier, you know, I really started to view technology as a missing piece as a way to build bridges between our communities. Um, you know, uh, we, um, I think one of the the sites that that um, we're going to show on this hangout is is this landing page that where we did a um, a a site that is dedicated to Cuban arts and culture, and there there it is. And what it is is um, it's essentially not only can you see the the Jose Marti uh, video here, but this is a place where you can see and explore virtually Cuban art, Cuban history, 
um, and kind of visit online some of the the archives that are um, you know housed in Cuba that we're making available to the rest of the world. This is just a start, and actually we have a lot of plans to expand this site. Um, but you know this is this is one of the this is one of the ways by by which that we're trying to kind of use Google platforms to be able to share culture, um, you know, creativity, uh, art, and history with the rest of the world. Okay. And actually, if you want to, if you want to visit the site, it's g.co slash Cuban arts. And again, that's g.co slash Cuban arts. Terrific. I look forward to checking it out and everyone else should. Um, you talked about your, your, your personal story as a Cuban American. Um, and you know, I think we all understand the, the emotion, the history, um, oftentimes the, the baggage that comes with that. Do you have any particular advice for a Cuban American that's considering traveling to the island or has already decided and is preparing to, to travel to Cuba for the first time? Totally. Um, first of all, do it. Absolutely do it. Um, get as many people as you can uh, in your family on board as well. And I, I say that knowing that it's not always as simple as, as that. Um, trust me, you know, I, I lived it. Um, I, you know, since I, since I can remember, I wanted to, to visit Cuba. Um, I visited Cuba for the first time in 2008, um, with my father. And it was the first time he returned in 50 years since leaving Cuba. And it was an incredibly, it was probably one of the most moving trips of my life. Um, because not only were we able to, you know, I was able to see firsthand where I came from, but I was also able to understand my father in a way that I never would have otherwise. And I understood him in a way that um, was, you know, I saw him as a human and, and as a person that had a, had a life and a family before me. Um, and, you know, I saw the house that he was born in and, you know, I saw like, you know, he's obviously a grown man just crying and just, you know, you know, recalling all of these memories. And, um, for me, it was so magical because these places and these these things that existed only in my memory or in my imagination, all of a sudden I'm visiting and I'm walking through, you know, the, the room that my abuela told me that, you know, such and such story took place or where, you know, her father, you know, had, you know, had this experience, things like that. So um, I would say, um, so absolutely do it is the first, the first thing I'd say. The second thing is um, be open to experiencing Cuba for what it is, as opposed to what um, you have been told that it is. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of rhetoric and swirl that just gets thrown out there about what Cuba is or what people think Cuba is, um, especially among the, American, the Cuban American community. And um, I would venture to say that Cuba is um, probably more, um, you know, spectacular, marvelous, creative, amazing than anyone has, you know, th than, than anyone can tell you that it is. Um, the people are more inspiring. Um, you know, the creativity is more, um, you know, creative than you can imagine. So um, be open to talking to Cubans, be open, be open to visiting um, Paladares, you know, staying in Casa Peticulares, um, you know, kind of understanding Cuba for what it is, as opposed to um, what maybe your family or um, anyone else has told you that it is. That's, I, I couldn't agree more. As somebody who um, had the pleasure of doing all kinds of travel, bringing celebrities, students, um, business people, and everyone in between, I have to say that, you know, the most powerful experiences have been with Cuban Americans, um, you know, regardless of the generation, whether it's first generation, second generation, um, but coming back and, and nobody's ever regretted it. It can be powerful in different ways and it can be difficult, um, but I think everyone's always been glad um, that they've done it. And so I think that's great advice. On a light question, do you have, um, for some of our travelers, any, any advice on something that you wish you would have packed for, an essential item you have to bring when you travel to Cuba? Yeah, um, I would say a flash drive. Um, and I know that sounds kind of weird if you've never visited Cuba, but um, in Cuba, a flash drive is almost a form of currency. Um, the bigger, the better. And um, it's the way in which information is passed back and forth. Um, if you please bring a flash drive and try to track down a copy of El Paquete Semanal, which is um, Cuba's version of the internet, and it's a really fascinating way to um, kind of see what is happening, um, you know, what kind of uh, content, what kind of, you know, material, check out some of the magazines, check out, the, you know, the newspapers. Um, and uh, it's really a fascinating way to kind of, 
see Cuba in its in its most real and raw state. That's great advice. Um, in terms of your work at Google Cuba, you you guys have pretty much been on the fr front lines. I mean, from uh, being front and center during Obama's visit, some of the regulations, um, I think you guys have, have played a significant role in, in terms of building better connectivity between two countries. I know the, the Cuban president was in New York recently and you guys hosted him for a round table with other business leaders, um, all kinds of products and services you guys have introduced to the Cuban market. I mean, you've really been in this historic, incredibly exciting period of three, four years of change in US policy, but also change on the island. Um, if you had to narrow it down, is there one moment with Google, Google Cuba that's kind of that you're most proud of? Yes, absolutely. And actually, Colin, you hit the nail on the head. I think um, probably a, a just complete surreal milestone was um, last month, uh, or excuse me, in September, rather, um, we um, uh, had the honor of hosting the Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, as well as a Cuban delegation at Google. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we kind of have this 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 um, firm belief that Google's experience in Cuba is evidence that engagement works. And one thing that we've been trying to do is encourage more tech companies in Silicon Valley and across the U.S. to explore opportunities in Cuba. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about how you know tech companies are kind of in this this you know business of of having platforms that connect people. And our view is that the more platforms like this we can have in Cuba, the more there can be this free flow of information. Um, you know, between Cuba and the rest of the world. Um, so to this end, that, that was kind of the inspiration of why we um, envisioned this, uh, this round table. And what we did was we um, organized a round table discussion with, um, again, delegation, uh, a delegation of Cuban decision makers, including uh, the president. And we also invited ex executives from different tech companies. Uh, and all of these companies either were already working in Cuba or had an interest in working in Cuba and learning more. And really the goal was to have this exchange of ideas and to how to facilitate greater collaboration between the U.S. tech sector and Cuba. Um, overall, I can say the meeting was incredibly respectful. It's encouraging to see how many companies want to work in Cuba and do their part to make sure that their products and services are available to Cubans. Um, and likewise, the Cuban delegation expressed an interest in engaging with more tech companies. Um, and, you know, obviously for background, because of the longstanding embargo between the U.S. and Cuba, there there has traditionally been little contact between the U.S. private sector and Cuban entities. Um, and this was a historic meeting because it was the first time that a Cuban leader has ever met with the U.S. private sector in the U.S. So it's definitely one of the more kind of surreal moments um, Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, before we go, I know we have some eager folks that signed on that have um, questions as well. Just one last question before we go to them. I've heard through the grapevine you guys have something fun coming up with Condesina and that you guys are working with them. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Totally. Oh my gosh, we're so excited about this. Um, for those of you that um, don't know, there is an amazing, amazing um, uh, company in Cuba, a private company called uh, Clandestina, they're a Havana-based independent design fashion line. Um, Clandestina is owned by two amazing, amazing women, um, and we have been inspired by them for quite some time. Um, we first got, we first kind of noticed them because they made popular the um, offline chrome dinosaur. If any of you have ever tried to connect to the internet when you're offline, you see the gray chrome dinosaur. Um, and they kind of made this theme popular throughout Havana and we would be down there, you know, on trips and we'd see this like all, all throughout the city and we're like, what is that? Um, and, uh, you know, we, they kind of used it as a symbol, right? Because Cuba's offline. So it's like this cheeky joke about, you know, the prehistoric age. Um, well, that was, that was about five years ago. Now, clearly there's been a lot of, you know, progress. There's, you know, more Wi-Fi parks rolling out. Um, you know, we've been doing connectivity work. And so we approached them and actually kind of, uh, you know, to have this collaboration around fashion, technology, and connectivity. And um, the result is that we have partnered with them to do a line of clothing that's inspired by the chrome dinosaur. So um, next month, or excuse me, actually this month, uh, we're in November already. Um, on the 15th of November, we're having a fashion show to launch this collaboration and to be able to uh, show the elements of our work. So um, if anyone is in Havana or if you'd like to attend, 
the 15th of November. Be there. Awesome. That's so exciting. And if you want to visit Glandesina's website, it's glandesina.co. I strongly encourage it as well. Um, perfect. So let's go. I think our first question is from Isabel, who I think is in the heart of Hialeah right now. Turn it over to you. <laughs> hey, Susanna. Um, so I have a question about what it's like working on Cuba policy and Cuba, and just with Cuba now. There's been, you know, we've lived through hype and we're now in a different era. And I know you're not new to, to working with Cuba. So what's it like now? Is it, do you feel it's more important? Is it different? Is it harder? Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, and hi, hi from, hi, hi to Miami um, for me. Um, you know, I think on one hand it's, on one hand it's harder, but on the other hand, I think it's, it nothing really has changed. Um, I think we. I was in. I was in Havana earlier this week, and one thing that um, is consistent is that Cubans are pounding the table the hardest for internet, um, and that that hasn't changed. I think, um, and we see that every single time that we're there. Um, and um, you know, one thing that that you know remains remains constant is what we want to do in Cuba, and we're grateful that. Um, that we have our work um, has been preserved, um, and we want to uh, within the sanctions, um, and we continue offering um, our services in Cuba. Um, we, our goal, we we want to build a vast digital highway to connect Cuba and the U.S. to the rest of the world, and we want again, we want this free flow of information and ideas. Um, and we want to offer as many products and services as possible, as legally possible, um, in Cuba. And you know, this this time, you know, I think one of the, one of the tendencies is that you know there's always these Cuba moments. Tensions always seem like they're high, but really, that's actually the only constant here um, is that tensions always seem quote unquote high. But you know, I think um, really the, the things that haven't changed are um, I think those that are that want to continue to pave away are continuing to move forward, and that's what we're doing. Terrific. Um, should we turn it over to Leanne for a question now? Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Leanne. How are you? Good. Thank you. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you for doing this. This is great. Of course. And thank you to Cuban Educational Travel and Cuba One. Um, my name's Leanne. I traveled to Cuba for the first time last year with Cuba One. And um, I'm a filmmaker based in New York, grew up in Miami. Um, there are a few Cuban YouTubers who I follow and I notice they're reaching a, a wider global audience and ironically a lot of them are unknown or unheard of on the island. Um, many of them talk about and show everyday Cuban life and uh, it's mainly Havana centric although there's some others popping up around the island. Uh, what does Google Cuba think about young Cubans reaching a global audience through YouTube? And are there any specific YouTubers uh, who you would re who you like and recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, just a sneak peek, we have a lot a lot in the pipeline as as far as YouTube goes. Um, this has been an area that we have been working on doubling down on. Um, and um, but I think generally, I'll say you know YouTube is probably the cornerstone platform by which we think that Cubans can share and exchange with the rest of the world. And one of the things that um, we want to continue to do is not only facilitate um, greater ease of use with YouTube as a platform from Cuba, but also we want to facilitate um, uh, Cubans make using YouTube um, to a greater degree. Um, and uh, one of the things actually that our, I mentioned that we signed an internet deal in 2016, and one of the things that that does, um, that did is actually make YouTube work in real time, as I mentioned. So in other words, what that means is that instead of Cubans accessing a YouTube video and the page loads and buffers and buffers for 10 hours and then the page crashes, it actually works in real time. So that the, 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 the video loads instantaneously and that has incredible implications for the way that people consume information. For example, how to videos, if someone's trying to get, you know, uh, lessons or educational content or how to information on fixing something. Um, and so one of the things that we, um, really want to that we've really tried to focus on is making YouTube work better for Cubans. Um, we've had a specific emphasis um, because we are aware of the not only the YouTube community in in Cuba but also the musicians. 
Um, I think there's an incredible opportunity for the musicians and the creatives in Cuba that um, there's some that are already connected to the platform, but we want to be able to connect as many of them as possible. Um, we have plans for um, rolling out um, YouTube programs to Cuban musicians specifically. Um, and we're working on the details of launching that. We'll definitely keep you posted on that. Um, and as, as far as a, as far as a YouTube, a YouTuber to follow. One of my favorite right now is um, Emma Style. I don't know if you follow her, but she does. You, <laughs> yeah, she does um, like everyday life um, makeup. She is really funny, and I feel like she's my friend, although I've never met her. But I love her. <laughs> I love uh, Anita Con Swing also. It's very yes, funny. yes, very cool, very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, of course. Awesome. That's awesome. Let's go to Ruben with another question. Hi, Ruben. Hi, how's it going? Pretty I good, pretty good. Taking time. Yeah, to cool. Questions. Where, uh, where are you? Are you in Miami? I'm in the heart of Hialeah as well. Nice. <laughs> nice. Shout out to yeah. Miami. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, sure. So I recently, I recently volunteered in Cuba with uh, children in Old Havana. And I was curious, I read that you have children on your own. Have you introduced Cuba to them? How has it been for them? How are you, how are you doing to educate them? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so this is something I feel very strongly about. So I have two boys, um, three and two and a half, and they are, were born in California. Um, but, you know, I so I haven't taken them to Cuba yet, um, because mostly because they've been in diapers up until about six months ago. Now that they're out, I have plans to take them. But, um, you know, one of the things that I really want to do is I want to make sure that, you know, as they grow up, they hear from me the importance of, um, you know, feeling Cuban, being Cuban. And I want to make sure that they're proud of that the way that I was made to feel growing up. But um, one thing that's really important to me is I want them to have their own connection to Cuba. I want them to have their own firsthand experience on the island, not just what I what I say to them or not just, you know, secondhand knowledge or stories from me. I want them to go. So um, my secret, my secret dream is to be able to, you know, spend summers there with them so that they can make friends and spend time in the beaches and kind of have, you know, have Cuba become, you know, one of their second homes. So um, stay tuned for that. But thank you for the question. That's, that's definitely one of my secret goals. No, I, I think it's, a, it's very possible. I can Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's so exciting. Well, I think we're we're almost running out of time, but we have a ton to look forward to in terms of uh, Susanna bringing her kids to, to Cuba soon. We have the fashion show with Clandestina. We have new YouTubers uh, to follow, new uh, products and services with Cuban musicians. So there's a lot on the way. I think we learned a ton. Um, so we're super grateful, Susanna, for, for you joining us today and sharing your experience, your knowledge, all the great work. Um, couldn't have been better. And um, I want for, for everyone who's out there, um, please stay tuned. Our next Hangout session um, is with uh, with inaugural poet Richard Blanco, who performed at President Obama's uh, uh, inauguration. And that'll be next Friday, or sorry, next month, Friday, December 7th at 3.05 as well. And everyone knows what 3.05 means. So <laughs> we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cuba One. Thank you, thank you Colin and CET. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys.